Welcome to the Late Night Talk with me, your host, Ahmed Ali. And a very special night in live from the holy city of Karbala. Now, as millions of Muslims celebrate the Eid affiliated with sacrifice, or some may refer to it, the great festival, many across the world will celebrate this occasion. You know, whether you're living in the East or in the West, culturally known, when you celebrate Eid, you buy a fresh shirt, fresh pants, fresh pair of sneaks, stand in front of the mirror to look as fresh as possible, and then go to the mosque, pray, and so on and so forth. Now, is that what Eid is all about? Do we actually know the exact meaning of Eid? And how many Eids are there in the religion of Islam? I actually want to know that. All of these I mentioned, I want to know that. That's why we have our very special guest, Sayyid Ammar Naqshwani, who has joined us tonight to discuss Eid. Sayyidna. Eid Mubarak. Thank you, Habibi. Allah is inshallah, looking as fresh as possible. You're looking amazing. You know? So uh, we, we did mention freshness. Uh, begin it off. How fresh do you look from 1 to 10? Yeah, I'm good, you know, and, and these, uh, in these 49.3 degrees Celsius Iraq temperatures, I'm hanging in there. Okay. Although I'm drained underneath the suit at the moment, so the viewers probably see me as being... Um, Shiny. You know, I, I look all right, but under here, I'm gone. So, oh, okay. Uh, I had to admit that. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, all right. Now, uh, Sayyidina, uh, a lot of people wonder this. How important is Eid when talking about different religions? I know to Islam, it's, it's very important. People take it to a different degree, which we'll get to talk about. Uh, but how important is the Eid uh, in terms of other religions? I think one of the, you know, one of the most beautiful periods in in the year is whenever you see a religion celebrating its uh, greatest festivals. Yes. Uh, I've been fortunate to have traveled around the world and have witnessed some of the most wonderful festivals within, for example, the religion of Islam and outside of the religion of Islam. Yeah. And you find that the smiles on people's faces is something unique. When I'm walking here in Karbala this evening, and I know everybody's th been through over uh, 35, 40 years of oppression in this country, and yet you find that everybody's smiling. Yes. You know, there are people out here who are probably on minimum wages in most countries, yeah. but they're with their families, they're having a great time. You see the balloons everywhere, you know, you see the candy being sold. Yeah. And that's what festivals really bring in any community. And that's why I'll tell you, you know, I may not be Christian, but Christmas I find as being one of the most wonderful periods in the, in the calendar. And Prophet Jesus alayhi salam is of course the prophet of the religion of Islam, as well as being revered in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at the atmosphere and you're looking at the lights, those same lights that you see in the Hindu festival of Diwali, for example. Yes. All of these festivals bring a great atmosphere within the communities that could be so ravaged by poverty yep. or by oppression. Yes. Um, and each of these religions has a spiritual element to it. You know, uh, there's a new start in Diwali. There's the recognition of God's blessings with Christ and Christmas. And likewise, when you come to the Eid and the religion of Islam, you find that each of the celebrations in the religion of Islam has their own special significance. Yes. So it's a wonderful time of year, and I, you know, I wish everybody, uh, you know, a special um, holy day tomorrow, yes. or whenever they've celebrated the Eid, and um, hopefully it continues to come back every year and bring us more and more blessings from God. Hopefully, so it's yeah. safe to say that it's a sort of happiness, you know, a, a source that brings everyone together. Uh, you know, whether you're living in the East or in the West, people actually, I know people who fly distances just to be with their families on a specific day. Uh, you know, people are in Arafah right now, uh, or they finished Arafah, they're just uh, doing the rituals of Eid. Now, uh, is Eid mentioned in the Quran? It's an interesting question. Eid is mentioned only once in the Holy Quran. And it's mentioned in Surah 5 of the Holy Quran, which is? Surah 5, Al-An'am. Ma'idah, fantastic, Ma Ma yes. yes. So it's mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah. We're getting there, number we're getting one? there, number we're one? getting there. I just got to tell them that, number one. Okay, okay, we're getting there. <laughs> Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is known as the table spread or the supper. Yes. What some might refer to as the Holy Supper or oh, the Last so. Supper. Yes. And again, it's in reference to Prophet Jesus alayhi salam. The disciples of Prophet Jesus are, of course, mentioned in different parts of the Quran. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes their story is mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Sometimes their story is mentioned in Surah Yasin. Yes. The famous line, وَإِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهُمْ اثْنَيْنِ فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثِ أَحْسَنْتِ So you have these different parts of the Qur'an. Well, it is Eid and you know, we're yeah. in a merry mood. Yeah. You have these different parts of the Holy Qur'an where God speaks about the disciples of Jesus. And yes. the disciples of Jesus, like I think the companions of any prophet, have got moments where they want an increase in their certainty. Yes. There's different levels of yaqeen. Ilm is different to ayn. Ayn is different to haqq. My knowledge of what fire is, is not the same as when I see fire, okay. which is not the same as when I'm burnt by fire. My knowledge of the fact that God looks after our sustenance, mm -hmm. I may see it, but it's not the same when I actually touch that sustenance. The disciples of Jesus السلام, ask him, can your Lord send us down food from the heavens? He replies back to them by saying, are you not certain about who I am or about what my Lord can provide for you? They said, no, we want an increase in our certainty. It's only something natural. Even Nabi Ibrahim السلام, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show him how he raises the dead and makes them Alive. Yeah. The line then in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 114 is the only ayah in the Holy Quran where the word Eid is mentioned. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It says Isa ibn Maryam, Allahumma Rabbana anzil alayna ma'idatan min as-sama'i takunu lana Eidan. Oh, okay. Li-awwalina wa akhirina wa ayatan mink warzuqna wa anta so the ayah in the Quran begins when Jesus, son of Mary, said, Oh Allah, our Lord, Allahumma Rabbana anzil alayna ma'idatan min as-sama. Takunu lana eidan. When you send this holy spread or holy supper from the skies, it will become a day of Eid for us. Wow. It will become a day of Eid for the first of us and for the last of us. Means that Eid may be an occasion which can be defined as whenever there is God's blessings sent on mankind as a form of guidance, it is to be celebrated by those present at the event and every single one who hears about that event forever. Otherwise, that Eid would just be an Eid for him and his disciples. Yes. When he says, Allahumma Rabbana anzil alayna ma'idatan min as-sama'i takunu lana Eidan li-awwalina wa akhirina wa ayatan mink. It's a sign from you. A day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his blessings. A day when Allah announces one of his signs on the earth. Look at the definitions. A day in which Allah's mercy extends upon mankind. Yes. And also it's a day of great sustenance. وَرْزُقْنَا وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّازَقِينَ There is an ayah which number one we can use as a great, a great common denominator for our interfaith discussions with the Christian world. Mm -hmm. There are many Christians in the world who do not know that the Quran mentions Mary more than the Bible does. There are many Christians in the world that do not know that the Quran has more about the virgin birth of Christ than the Bible does. And there are many who do not know that the Quran even discusses the supper that came down upon the disciples of Christ. Yes. So therefore, this ayah of the Holy Quran represents the only time the word Eid is mentioned within the Holy Book mm -hmm. and highlights a particular celebration of God's mercy and blessings upon mankind. Mm -hmm. Now, it, does that mean that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends His mercy or you know His His blessings, a person has to celebrate? Is that considered as Eid? Or is there just sp special occasions that you know sent to prophets like Jesus or Prophet Muhammad? The or? birth of a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an Eid. Because okay. as you mentioned, Ahmed, quite rightly, if you look at the word Eid, if you look at the derivatives, al awda Ya'ud, it signifies a return. Okay. 
Every year when we remember the birth of a prophet like the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, that should be an Eid for us. Okay. Because it's reminding us of that day of mercy which continues to pour and shower itself upon the Muslims in their lives. Therefore, to signify Eid as being only, for example, related to Al-Adha or Fit, no. The birth of a prophet or the birth of a saint from the line of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, that is also a day of Eid. Okay. A day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided man is also a day of Eid. If there is a day where someone is mentioned as a guide for mankind, it's a day of Eid. If there's a day where Islam was victorious, that's a day of Eid. Any day where we see God's mercy and blessings upon us is no doubt a day of celebration. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, this part, we're going to get personal. In. I mean, in ev everywhere across the world, when it's Eid time, even during Christmas, you see the sales going on crazy. Huge discounts. Now, Sayyidina, uh, five things. If someone, or if you were to tell someone what to buy for Eid, five things. Watch. Oh, you don't want to see my list. The person will go bankrupt. Okay. Watch, shoes, cologne, sunglasses, and sneakers. Allahu Akbar. Well, uh, watch. I think everyone has to have on their wrist the Daytona. Cologne, okay. Creed, Aventus. That's, uh, Shoes, okay, so definitely good. made by Prada. Okay, so we're up to five grand right now. Sunglasses, chrome hearts, sneakers, Hogan's. Okay, so you... Are you ready to buy these for me tomorrow or no? So, so you... Because in Iraq, I'm sure uh, <laughs> Prada or Hogan's must have a store over here. Oh yeah, they do. They or maybe do. Chrome Hearts has in, a store. In Shal Abbas, they do. Shal Abbas should have, yes. Yeah. We should check out Bab al Qibla, should have something on the corner. But yes, uh, you know... In the Chire, they do, yeah. I, I think I'm going to be waiting for those five, by the way. Now that you forced me into that... No, I'll get you the exact copy of them. Made in China, though. Inshallah, we'll, no, we'll I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, what I mean from that is that a lot of people tend to focus on shopping during Eid. Now, is that an okay thing or is that something that's, uh, you know, um, happy, something good for, for I the think community? it's great. I think a lot of people have said that Eid and Christmas and other festivals have become consumer, you know, consumer places or consumerized and so on. Is it not good though? I think it's great. I, you know, I, look, the focus shouldn't be that. Okay. But let's face the facts. When you were a kid, when I was a kid, wouldn't you wait for your ID? Oh, yeah. Wouldn't you wait for that, you know, you go to your grandma, your grandfather, or you go to your parents and you're like, come on, give me something. And the parents would give you, you know, a certain note if you're lucky. Or they'd go to buy you, uh, you know, you want a watch, you want the latest game. When we were children, that was our understanding of festivals. Yeah. Now, I don't see a problem with, you know, the family is all gathered here quite wonderfully in Karbala. You know, they're all going, they're going shopping, they're trying to, you know, bring a day of joy to each other. It's a day of Allah's mercy upon yes. one another. But I'll tell you something that happened. We were um, at the house of Imam Ali, and, uh, at the house of Imam Ali in, Kufa. Uh, in Kufa. Yeah. And um, while we were there at the house, myself and um, Murtada Kanani, the head of spiritual journeys, were sitting down. And this lady came into the room where we were sitting with the Imam of the, of the area where they pray. And she, she inquired about something. The Imam said to her, that, just wait outside, I'll get back to you. And we asked, what is it? And she said she just wanted some money to go and buy her children some Eid gifts. Wow. Because they are so poverty stricken in some parts of Iraq that we might joke about, you know, having a Daytona or having Chrome Hearts or having a Creed. Joking. Okay, not I might be, not be joking, but <laughs> at the same time, if, I, if you're willing to spend money on these things, then you shouldn't be hesitant about looking after someone's smile on the day of Eid. Yeah. That lady wanted $50, $100. And so if some of us are going to go out there and we're going to spend money, we should bear in mind to have a thought for those people in the world that will not come anywhere near what we have. I'm not saying that you'll buy happiness on the day of Eid by giving someone money. But you could certainly rent happiness for that one day. Yes. You know, mind you, I've seen some of these families who don't have any of the things that we've mentioned. But I'll tell you what, they can all sit on a dinner table and smile. Yeah. And there are people out there on the day of Eid who can't even get their kids around them because of the fact that everyone's 
you know, disunited in the family or there are quarrels in the family. Yeah. So I think while Eid can be seen in some cases as going towards the direction of consumerism, yeah. which I don't think is always negative, but I think it becomes negative if a person forgets about the affairs of the Ummah mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the good things uh, about shopping during Eid is the discounts because really you can, it's, it's consumerism as, as you mentioned. Now, let's bring down the Eids, different Eids. First, we have Eid al-Futr. If you can mention something about that, and then we'll talk about the different Eids we have as well. Well, Eid al-Futr is a wonderful Eid because you're celebrating the, the discipline that you've achieved in the month of Ramadan. Okay. You know, when you come to Eid al-Futr, what's interesting about the Eid prayer is the two chapters which are recommended to be recited in Salat al-Eid. Surat al-A'la and Surat al-Shams. Why? Why? In Surat al-Shams and Surat al-A'la, you've got the two verses in the Holy Quran that talk about Tazkiyat al-Nafs. The purification yeah. of, of the self where you've achieved a level of wonderful discipline. Yes. In the holy month of Ramadan, it was difficult to fast in the heat but we were lucky that we were breaking our fast at say seven-ish. There were people who were breaking their fast at nine, nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock, yeah. having had the longest day at work. To be able to have a month of self-discipline, that definitely deserves a wonderful celebration. It does. Hence, when we come to Salat al-Eid, in Surah al-Shams, you find us reciting the wonderful verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa nafsi wa ma that nafs, that self, successful is the one who purifies it. Yeah. When you're able to purify your nafs, then you should celebrate that month of purification. Definitely. It was a physical purification and the fact that your stomach was purified from being a graveyard for animals. Although the way some Iraqis eat iftar, I don't know if there's any difference. I remember seeing what I would call replicas of Mount Everest on a plate. Wallah, you can. A replica of Mount Everest on a plate. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, are you for real? Now I know you're starving and I'm starving, yeah. but I always find they go in. that when I want to break my fast, I find that it becomes the anticlimax that you don't eat as much as you expected. Yeah, you don't. Well, I've, seen some guys, I've seen some guys, I've seen some guys munch. I've seen some guys not munch, devour. Wow. Now, <laughs> so you've got physical aspect, which you'd hope you're celebrating, but you're yeah. also celebrating the spiritual aspect. Uh -huh. You've got the guys who curse normally, and then the whole month they've tried to stop it. Yeah. People who lie, gossip, bang. So it's, it's Eid al-Fatr is that celebration. Where you just go all out. Well, I hope you don't go all out, <laughs> but there's a self-discipline that's there, which I think yeah. is fundamental. Yes. <clears throat> I think at the same time, remembering the poor. Yeah. Because we then return back to a life where on the day of Eid, you can go to the best Michelin star restaurant. You could just book one straight away. You could go to the best of restaurants. You and your family have the best table. You're not even thinking about the money. And that there are certain families who have to go back to the world where they have to w walk three, four kilometers to find water. Wow. And that's why Zakat al-Fitr, for example, is something fundamental that a person takes a certain amount of money out yes. on behalf of them and their family members mm -hmm. to try and make sure that we all gather an amount to look after those who have not achieved what we may have, for example, continued to go back to. Yes. They may still be poverty stricken. So Eid al-Fitr is that celebration of the disciplining of oneself and the ability to enter the world of altruism. Mm -hmm. For example, you find that that world where you've entered is not the world anymore of I, it's the world of we. I now enter a world where I think of others, not just myself. So that celebration at the end of the month of Ramadan is a celebration which really is one of the most poignant when you reflect upon it. Mm -hmm. And it's beautifully how you mentioned it. Because, you know, Eid, especially after Ramadan, as a whole month of, you know, uh, really, really disciplining oneself.
Mm. Uh, you get to celebrate. Now, uh, tonight we're celebrating Eid Al-Adha, mm. uh, the month or the Eid of sacri Sacrifice, mm. uh, as some may refer to it. What's the background of Eid Al-Adha? Well, Eid Al-Adha is the recognition that we are honoring Prophet Abraham okay, so and his willingness to sacrifice all that he had for his Lord. So pre-Islam? Yes. The actual Eid is one which is, of course, Islamic Eid. Yeah. But the remembrance of Abraham's sacrifice. Okay. And the remembrance of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice for his Lord. Mm -hmm. What Abraham did with Ismail is the greatest moment of love you'll see. What Hajar or Hagar done with her son in being willing to sacrifice all for the Lord is the highest level of love. Now those who receive the most reward on these days are those who are either in the land of Mecca during, you know, at Arafah or Muzdalifah or Mina, yeah. or those in the land of Karbala. Because the poet says it beautiful. He stands in Karbala looking towards those at Mina, for example. O oh, you who are about to sacrifice, come join me in the land of sacrifice. Wow. O oh, you who are about to drink Zamzam, my tears for Hussein make the real Zamzam. So, in Eid al Adha, Ibrahim, السلام, Imam al Hussein, السلام, the sacrifices are immense when you reflect upon them. Many Muslims will reflect upon Nabi Ibrahim, السلام, sacrifice, but we know Ismail wasn't killed. Yeah. Whereas the six month old baby of Hussein was butchered on these planes. Yes. So, that Eid again, but once again, Surah Al-Shams we said, وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ Surah Al-A'la is another Surah to be recited in Salat Al-Eid. Okay. And we have one line, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Successful is the one who has purified himself. When I come for Eid Al-Adha, it's not a matter of, oh, it's another Eid, let's just celebrate. It's a recognition that, you know what, it's another start. It's another time to remember Allah's mercy upon me. Yes. Amta. I am one of those who's trying to follow those who have been blessed by Allah. Wow. I'm fortunate that I was born into the religion of Ibrahim. Let's not take this for granted. Imam Sadiq says, if you don't want God's blessings to ever leave you, always say Alhamdulillah and Shukran Lillah. A day like this, a person should be ready to be thankful to Allah yes. that he was born in a religion that has Abraham and his sacrifice as a principle in that religion. So that's really seen as the background of Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha. Now, another Eid that um, uh, Muslims do celebrate is Eid al-Mubahala. Now, this is the famous story that goes around in the Quran. Uh, now, why is this considered as an Eid? Isn't just just a regular occasion? Or Eid al-Mubahala is arguably one of the most blessed days in the religion of Islam. The mm. incident of Mubahala is an incident which is mentioned in Sunni and Shia literature. If you look at the tafsir of Surah 3, verse 59 to 61, tafsir al-Jalalain, Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti and Jalal al-Din al-Mahalli have a tafsir known as tafsir al-Jalalain, famous Sunni tafsir of the Holy Quran. And if you look at our books of tafsir, you find that the Christians of Najran had heard that Islam had now taken over the Arabian states. And they wanted to know what was their position. Are they going to be allowed to freely worship in their church or no? They had a church that was known as Ka'bat Najran. Okay. 40,000 people used to go towards that church. They came to Medina. They wanted to meet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. When they came to the mosque of Medina, they met Abd al-Rahman bin Awf and Uthman bin Affan. Oh. Said to them, we'd like to see the Prophet Muhammad. They told them, Imam Ali is there. Go and speak to Ali ibn Talib. Went to Ali ibn Talib. Imam said to them, tomorrow come in more humble clothing. You're wearing your jewelry and diamonds and rubies. Come tomorrow a bit more humble. And you'll see the prophets of God. When the Christians came to meet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, they began to ask him a series of questions. Now, this event takes place 
a year and a bit before the Prophet passes away. So we're talking uh -huh. the ninth year after Hijrah, okay. in the month of the Hijjah. They come to meet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Of course, they don't believe he's the Prophet of God. They said to Muhammad, we want to ask you some questions. They said, go ahead. They said, who's Yusuf's father? Who's Joseph's father? He said, Jacob. Tick. Who's Moses' father? He said, Imran. Tick. Who's Jesus' father? First, they said, who's your father? He said, Abdullah. Then they said, who's Jesus' father? He said, he had no father. They said, then he must be the son of God. Because if he has no father, then God must be his father. The Quran replied in Surah 3, verse 59. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna mathala Isa and Allah ka mathali? Adam. Khalaqahum in Turab and Thumma qala lahu kun? Fayakun. The Quran said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The example of Adam in the eyes of God, the example of Jesus in the eyes of God, same as Adam. Jesus had a mother? Yes. Yes. But he had no father. Adam had a mother? No. no. Adam had a father? He's more worthy. So who deserved to be the son of God? Yeah. But they weren't convinced. So they were told to enter a mubahala. Mubahala is, you claim to be on the right path, I claim to be on the right path. Okay, let's ask God, if we're so certain, to curse those who are on the wrong path. So it's a type of war? Type, what, why? It's the invoking of a curse. Why though? Or just debate? Ah. They're coming to the man who says he's the prophet of God. If you want to challenge him, he's not going to kill you. But don't go back and spread things that we challenge them. You couldn't answer our questions. And don't say that you never met the man who's the prophet of God later on. I'm going to give you every proof you want. Because if the prophet gets hesitant in this moment, they're like, why should we follow him? But when the prophet says, ask God to curse me if I'm the Antichrist or if I'm a Messiah, let God curse me at this moment. They knew about it in their literature as well. When they return, the Quran mentions a wonderful ayah in chapter 3, verse 61. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوْ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ Quran said, if they dispute with you after the knowledge has come to them, yes. say to them, come, we'll bring our sons, you bring your sons. We'll bring our woman, you bring your woman. We'll bring ourselves, you bring your selves. selves. The companions that night were thinking, who's he going to take with him? Because when it says, Abna'ana, Abna'akum, okay, maybe Nisan and Sa'akum. Okay. Prophet at that time is married to a few wives. And Fusana and Fusakum, who does he count as his own self? Oh. That's a high station to be. It's a huge. The Christians were also that night wondering, who's he going to bring with him? If he brings his companions, we'll enter a mubahala. If he brings his family, we won't. Because a man who's willing to take his family and sacrifice them for his religion is a man of God. Wow. The next day, the Prophet has his sons takes Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein. They were six and five at the time. As the woman, he could have taken any of his wives. He takes Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. She is Sayyid at Nisa al-Alameen. As himself, he takes Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, and that's why the Prophet would always say, Ali min nafs al rasul Suyuti an mahalli in tafsir al jalalain Narrate that he took Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein. So they went towards the Christians when the Christians saw that he had bought his family. They said, We won't enter a mubahala. Because the amount of light that shines from those five faces, if it told a mountain to move it, the mountain would move from its position. Wow. That day is an Eid. Because that day, the mystical position of Al Muhammad was even more confirmed than even on the incident of Kisa a couple of years earlier. Mm -hmm. When the incident of Kisa took place, Allah had sent His grace. And now, with the incident of Mubahala, Allah is sending His grace upon them. And highlighted that with 100,000 Muslims in Medina at the time, there's no one who comes near Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. Okay. Now, Sayyidina, if, you know, al mubahala is considered as Eid, why isn't al Hadith al kisa like the actual incident of Kisa, considered as Eid? Why isn't Badr considered as Eid? Uhud? The, 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 these the, are the battles that Prophet Muhammad did win. Why aren't they considered as Eid? These are all days of Eid. Any day. But they're not called Eid. Some, for example, 
may say that the exact date of these we don't know so we won't we can say the incident is an Eid but a day we want to give Mubahala we know the day Adha we know the day Fatar we know the day with Kisa and others it's different historical narrations about the exact date but that does not mean that if you have for example one of the opinions about the date why not that could be the day of Eid remember we said a day of Eid is a day where one of the ayahs, one of the signs of Allah has shown. A day of Rizq. These are all great days for us which we can celebrate mm -hmm. as well. Like which, which battle did the Faqar come to Imam Ali Talib? Well, is, you is, have from the Battle of Badr. Is it, yeah. is, is it not? That's the day of Eid. So why don't Muslims uh, celebrate well, it? Muslims, if they want to. I know many Muslims who on the 17th and 18th of Ramadan, give lectures about the battle of Badr and the greatness of that battle uh -huh. that's also a form of celebration okay to remember celebration doesn't have to have the word Eid next to it but because Eid al-Fitr Eid al-Adha were known with the words Eid then there were other cultures started with this in yeah. yeah yes now uh, yes we do understand that good thank you uh they're giving me comments in my ear uh now say that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam we hear uh mentioning numerous times uh, that the greatest Eid is Eid al-Ghadir. Now, as you mentioned just now, Mubahala is one of the greatest because, you know, Prophet Muhammad or the Ummah saw the greatness of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam. Now, is Eid al-Ghadir even greater than that or is it just... Now, Eid al-Ghadir definitely is the greatest Eid in the religion of Islam. Islam was completed with the prophethood of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. There's no doubt. Okay. The perfection of that complete religion was to ensure that a man was chosen as the leader for the Muslims mm -hmm. who could protect the interpretation of the Quran from going wayward in the way Rasulullah protected the revelation of the Quran from going wayward. But he mentioned it earlier. Numerous times earlier, he said that Ali is the successor after me. But on the day of Ghadir, Islam was at its greatest. Mm -hmm. It had reached the largest number. He was near his death. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, Ya ayyuha rasul balligh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Wa in lam taf'al fama balligta rasalata. If you don't, your, the message is incomplete. What is this thing which if Rasulullah does not say the message is incomplete? What is don't it? tell me it's about halal food. It's about making it clear for the ummah who is going to lead them after him. He's the final prophet. But who's going to lead the Muslims in their political, theological, spiritual guide? I'm not talking guide of the mundane affairs, administration. I'm talking who's the embodiment of spirituality. Who's the embodiment of ethics on the earth? Yes. Who does not have a blemish on his character at all? Until today, the Muslims cannot decide how a leader was to be chosen after the Prophet died, except the school of Ahlul Bayt, where we say clearly, our Prophet announced the leader on behalf of Allah SWT. Ask other Muslims, tell them, after Rasulullah died, how was the leader chosen? Some say, well, he was implicitly chosen. Others say, well, it was an election. Then you say, well, the second caliph, well, the second caliph was chosen by the first, and the third caliph chosen in a shura of six, and the fourth caliph chosen by the whole Muslim community. Until today, the Muslims are in chaos when it comes to how a leader is chosen. The day of Ghadir, Allah said, all of you calm down. If I leave it in your hands to choose, you'll choose those who befit your worldly affairs, not the one who befits your hereafter. Mm -hmm. Whereas the one I choose for you is the man who will give you victory in this world and the hereafter. Mm -hmm. So that day, that incident of Ghadir, where the Prophet stops at, Ghadir, at the place called Khum, mentioned clearly in Sahih Muslim, that Zayd bin Arqam narrates that the Prophet stopped at Khum and mentions leaving behind the Quran Ahl al-Bayt, mentions that the wives are not part of the Ahl al-Bayt, you could see in Sahih Muslim, that they are technically part of the family, but not who this ayah is revealed about, and mentions the sons of Ali amongst the sons of Ja'far, the sons of Aqil, the sons of Abbas as being his Ahl al-Bayt alongside the Quran. Mm -hmm. When Ghadir takes place, 
the talking Quran is alongside the written Quran. The walking Quran is alongside the written Quran. The man who's announced is the very man who's the embodiment of the teachings of the Quran. Mm -hmm. You cannot separate a moment of his life from any of the principles of the Quran. And a man who the Prophet said, I am the city of knowledge and he is its gate. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to look all of that, I mean, the completion of the ayah you mentioned, Wallahi asimuka min nas So if Prophet Muhammad did mention that, you know, Ali Talib is going to be after me, and is a successor, and Muslims did do bay'ah, and Allah will protect him from the people, later on we see something different happen. So is that still an indication that Prophet Muhammad uh, Ali is the rightful successor? That refers to the announcement. That refers to the announcement. Oh, it's just a regular announcement. That when the announcement made. is made, when Allah says, Wallahi, asamukam in nas yeah. Allah is making clear to him, get up and announce. Don't worry about those people who are the hypocrites around you. When you're going to make that announcement, none of them can do a thing to you. Because but later on they did. the hesitancy at that moment when you want to go up at Ghadir and announce, there's munafiqeen all around you. Some of them could come and stab you there and then. Yeah. Allah protected him. Have you ever heard anyone say, Rasulullah's sermon at Ghadir was interrupted? Or did they come and congratulate Imam Ali after he was announced? Did Allah therefore protect that whole sermon? Did Allah protect that announcement? Even today when Muslims say, we don't necessarily agree that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the first Imam, none of them can deny that the word Mawla was used next to him. Yes. They could certainly differ on the opinion of the word Mawla means. But none could ever say that Rasulullah did not complete his task of saying, فَمَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَىٰ فَادَ عَلِيْ مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَىٰ فَادَ عَلِيْ مَوْلَىٰ Now, at the end of the day, when we do celebrate Eid, you know, a lot of people after Ramadan, as you mentioned earlier, you can't listen to music, you know, people restrain themselves uh, from swearing, from backbiting, all these negative things that they do in their life, regular days in Ramadan, they refrain from it. But after Ramadan, in Eid, they throw parties and the music and there's drinking and you know having fun and so on and so forth now is that allowed put the drinking aside throwing parties is that allowed is that not allowed of course go throw parties rent out a club you know go out and enjoy us no of course not you know i think sometimes I was, the muslims i, was about I know to. you were about to jump <laughs> i think you were about to book a flight no i think i think sometimes sometimes the muslims because they don't understand the philosophy of what they've just celebrated yeah or sometimes some only do the act out of fear of hell. And that at the end, once you've done that, you're like, okay, I'm going back to what I used to do. I've seen some Muslims, they'll say to you, in Muharram, we don't listen to music. Say, okay. And say, in Safar, we don't listen to music. So, okay. Why? Say, Muharram, Safar, Ahl al Bayt, did you see what they went through? So I say, how about after Safar? Oh, it's all back to normal. So, Ahl al Bayt, Alim al Salam only are alive in Muharram Safar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only hears us and sees us in Muharram and Safar. Then there are others you'll see in London, for example. Eid party at this club at this time. And you'll see people raving it up and the alcohol's out and they're drinking. Okay, those 30 days you fasted the holy month of Ramadan, what's the point of that self-discipline? Wasn't it a New Year's resolution, a clean start, blank slate? I saw someone who actually tried to back this up with a tradition where the Prophet allows the Muslims to play music on the day of Eid because he's like, listen, you guys have been doing a lot of ibadah now, go out and, you know, listen to some music. Have fun. And that's the problem. There are certain books we have in the religion of Islam which doesn't surprise me when Rushdie wrote the satanic verses because if you use those books, you can make a mockery of the Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. especially when you have authors who, without a doubt, or narrators who had hatred for him and his family. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, you know, some people may differ on the word party. You know, what's allowed and what's not allowed? You know, because regularly, you know, I, I've been to many Eid celebrations and, you know, they just go to the mosque, okay, pray Salat al Eid, eat breakfast, go home. You know, or they make a, like a, a party outside or take the kids to the park or something in the center. How to actually get people back to the mosque to have a proper party at the mosque rather than throwing a party at, at a club or a party somewhere else. 
Well, I've seen in communities where I've lectured that they've, they've done some fantastic things. You mm -hmm. know, some people have done um, a fun fair in the park for the whole community. Okay. Where they bring the bouncy castles and they bring all the games and the kids can enjoy themselves. I've seen some people do a barbecue outside the mosque in the street for all the neighbors, Muslims and non-Muslims come and celebrate. I think the mosques have to begin to include such festivity uh, for the community, yeah. you know? Uh, renting out a fun fair or renting out a park or taking people on a trip somewhere or letting the kids enjoy themselves. I think that's the way forward. The family should all be in unison with one another. The community should all get together, Muslim and non-Muslim. Because our non-Muslim neighbors, the fact that they help us in our worship in that month also deserve to join in. Yeah. So if you look at the Haidar Islamic Center, for example, in South London, they've done great work in having, you know, um, fun fairs in the park or barbecues, you know, street festivals. I think all of these things are things that can be introduced into our communities. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you take that and celebrating and taking it to the poor? How do you give back while still spending? I know we mentioned it a little bit, but if you can you know, emphasize on this point, is that how do I debate at the same time, do emphasize on the fact, you know, go have fun, you know, but with, with limitations, of course, celebrate, but at the same time, give back to the poor. Well, I think you look at Ahlul Bayt Salam's life and it's the very, the very meaning of beneficence and generosity. Um, they're, not, they're not too worried about helping those who look to them for help. Um, there are numerous ayahs in the Holy Quran which highlight that Ahlul Bayt never ever in their life reached the moment where they weren't willing to give back towards the creation of God. Okay. I think the day of Eid, a person, like on the day of Arafah, it's recommended for some people to give some charity. And I think the day of Eid as well is a day where we should try and look around us and see who's in need of our help. There are women who are the victims of domestic abuse. Maybe we can donate something to those shelters. There are people who are the victims of child abuse. Maybe we can donate to those shelters. There are, people, there are animal uh, uh, sanctuaries for animals that have been abused. Maybe we can donate to those places. There are places for orphans or the homeless. That's a wonderful way to celebrate yes. God's gifts and God's blessings. Definitely. Uh, I don't think it's just about exchanging gifts at home. I think building the sense of generosity in our families on the yes. day of Eid and taking our children to places to remind them. Also, I think visiting the graveyard for a few minutes on the day of Eid is something that can be very beneficial. Why? Your parents who may have passed away, your grandparents, if it wasn't for them, you'd never have this day. What if they're still alive? If they're still alive, go to their house. It's always great to go to your parents' house, give them a gift, and sometimes, subhanAllah, time with them is a gift. Yes. We think that it's all about buying something. Sometimes chilling with your parents is a gift. And I think that if more of us could do this, where we go to the graveyard to remember our marhumin, our blessed, beloved ones who passed away. Or we go to our family members, send messages, WhatsApp messages to our relatives, rebuild relations. These are also different forms of wonderful acts we can perform on the day mm -hmm. of Eid. Now, before we go into the break, there's one thing uh, that I would like to actually uh, talk about. Is how do we live Eid, you know, this celebration, uh, this source of happiness, you know, of joy, of, you know, giving back. Mm. Making everyone smile. You know, in, in the West, if you just open the door for someone, you have the smile right away on, on the person's face. Now, how, would it, how do we live the significance, the presence of Eid in our everyday life? Habibi, every day, Imam Ali ibn Talib says, every day you don't disobey Allah is the day of Eid. Every day yeah. in which you don't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know? Eid isn't just Adha, Fatr, Ghadir, Mubahala. Every day you're keeping away from sin is a Eid. It's not easy. Yes. But don't look at Eid as only those four days. Every day in which a person doesn't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also a day of celebration. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to go through a whole day without disobeying Allah in one way or the other. But if you can set yourself a target that, you know what, let me try and celebrate Eid every day. Let me see if I can get through days where I'm in full obedience to Allah. Therefore, you find the prophets of God will say, my prayers and my life and my death are all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to dedicate every day to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. When Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says, every day in which you don't disobey your Lord is a day which is Eid. Every day in which you don't sin is an Eid. 
that gives us the incentive that you know what don't limit it to four days mm -hmm. try every day to push and so that day becomes a day of Eid as well yes say so, now let's uh, take a short break and we'll be back shortly to continue celebrating uh, and uh, Eid in the way that Sayyid Ammar likes to celebrate uh, although we don't have the expensive stuff with us but yes uh, we'll be back uh, with Dr. Sayyid Ammar but after the short break so do stay tuned my dear brothers and sisters we're standing now in the area where the Battle of Al Khandaq, the trenches, or Al Ahzab, took place. On my right hand side, right now, this is the mosque known as Masjid Salman. And to my left hand side, up there, is Masjid known as Masjid al Fath. In that masjid, it's known as the Masjid of the Victory, the Mosque of Victory. That's where the Prophet prayed for the Muslims to have victory over the Mushrikeen at the Battle of Al Ahzab or Al Khandaq. And that's where the news of the victory of the Muslims came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam where the Mushrikeen have been defeated and the Muslims became victorious. So that's the masjid known as Masjid al Fath, and this is Masjid Salman and there is Masjid Ali ibn Abi Talib in the very back one unfortunately cannot see it from this distance and it's been closed down and unfortunately all these masajid are now closed down where a person cannot go inside and pray in the past we used to go and pray inside these masajid but now we cannot do that anymore and there used to be a masjid known as Masjid Fatima which unfortunately now has been demolished or it's been demolished for about over 20 years so these few masajid there were in total a seven of them in this region and all of them have been locked down or demolished and a masjid is now built to replace them and forcing the people to go inside these mas this masjid to pray. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our Imam Ajalallah ta'ala Farjahu Sharif so that inshallah all these masajid will be opened again and we can go back to praying inside them. Thank you. Respective viewers, welcome back. Hope you inshallah enjoyed uh, that short report. And we are back uh, live in Karbala, night of Eid. Everyone here, uh, Karbala is live. I just have to say that. Uh, you know, I, I wish you can see what I can uh, see right now. Every, Karbala is packed. Millions of people are in Karbala from different cities, from different countries, Said Ammar from different countries, uh, are here to celebrate Eid and to see what Karbala has to offer. Sayyidina, welcome back. Thank you. Eid Mubarak to you and Eid Mubarak to you as well, to you as well uh, my dear viewers. Now, Sayyidina, now we're in the segment of general questions. I do uh, encourage everyone to send their questions in so we can ask uh, Sayyid Ammar on general topics and general questions. Now, Sayyidina, uh, the first question is related to our topic and they say, how important is Eid for the unity of Muslims? I think it's uh, fundamentally important, you okay. know, celebration of Eid for the unity of Muslims especially living in a world now where we've had an unbelievable number of deaths in, yes. the, in the Muslim world and sadly sectarian tensions in some cases leading to these deaths extremism leading to these deaths when you're looking at Iraq for example where we're living the number of you know coffins that you see being carried yes because of what took place with ISIS and their bloodthirstiness and their hatred. And it's great to see how in Iraq, yesterday, where was I? Two days ago, I had gone quickly to Kazmain in Baghdad. And it was wonderful to see Shia and Sunni praying side by side in the haram of Imam Musa al kazim and Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam Nice. And that hopefully is the future for a land like Iraq where the Shia and Sunni are able to live by, side by side. Naturally, we have completely different opinions on certain historical issues, mm -hmm. different theological conclusions on some issues. But when it comes to Salah, it shouldn't be a case where a person comes and judges when someone is clearly in the middle of their prayers. And mm -hmm. that was wonderful to see in Iraq that at the height of the tension that had taken place, Shia, Sunni, Christian, all coming together as Iraqis, yeah to try and build a unified Iraq. Yes. Many try to portray a hatred between 
the different sects in Iraq. The reality was it was the internationally backed extremists yeah. who found certain people here who were willing to go with their ideology and many from outside. Yeah. But the Iraqi people united and the Muslims united. And now on the day of Eid, when I see the Muslims come together, Sunni and Shia, this highlights what a blessing and a form of rizq aid for yes. is for all of us. Yes. And I hope that, for example, Syria now returns back to the Syria of old, where Sunni and Shia used to live side by side. Yeah. And you hope that Bahrain, for example, the tension that's there. Hopefully. Or that helps. Saudi Arabia, you look at the Hawamiya area, you find how the Shia are being oppressed. Or you look at, for example, Burma, you look at Malaysia, you look at parts of Pakistan. The Kashmir area, Parachinar, got parts of Afghanistan. You hope that Eid can soften the hearts of the Muslims. Hopefully. And bring love between them again. Yes, inshallah. And just to mention to you, Sayyidina, and the dear viewers, Karbala now is more packed than the years before. You know, the, the years where Iraq witnessed the savagery of ISIS, uh, the pilgrims have lessened because the majority of their sons of their fathers were actually fighting against ISIS and now you know alhamdulillah 90% or 95% of the Iraqi territory that was under uh, ISIS is now you know liberated mm. so everyone is here in Karbala celebrating in Kazmiya and Najaf you know celebrating Eid and it's, it's beautiful uh, last to time that. I came to Araf you know I came on the day of Arafah last year and it certainly was not as packed as this year you yeah. know this year you could see the confidence back in the people yeah ISIS was it's destroyed like yeah. you know all credit to the Hashid and so on. And I, I, ISIS was completely destroyed. Um, and you see people's confidence coming back. And as mm -hmm. I said, you see Sunni, Shiite, Christian, all in the Baghdad area, for example, everyone living side by side, eating yes. at restaurants, celebrating. And this is, inshallah, the future. Inshallah. Now, Hussein asks, is there a book in Arabic I could please read on the Battle of Jamal? On the Battle of Jamal, the best book in Arabic is Sheikh Al Mufid. Okay. Sheikh Al Mufid's book, uh, Kitab Al Jamal, that is the best book you'll find. The Book of Jamal. Yes, on the Battle of Jamal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question we have What three maqatil would you recommend to read? Maqatil. Three maqatil I would recommend to read. I would say uh, Abu Mikhnaf, Ibn Tawus, and uh, Abbas Qummi. I would mm -hmm. say these three, if one was to read the different analysis of Karbala and the different narrations, uh, these would be three wonderful works which could be read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other question we have is what are the main ideology of Sufism? Well, Sufism is not a sect in Islam. Sufism is the adoption of a certain way of life, mm -hmm. a spiritual way of life. Sometimes growing in a period where the Muslim community is riddled with theological or legal debates which can reach a level so pedantic that your average Muslim feels that we've forgotten the spiritual essence of the religion of Islam and are purely focused on theology and law. Those who are Sufi in their origin, Suf refers to wall. Wall, yeah. As this idea that those who would wear the wall at very hot temperatures, highlighting that they had shunned the world. What's interesting when you look at many of the chains of the Sufi schools is that they will return back to the Ahlul Bayt السلام, because mm -hmm. the masters of spirituality are, are the Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Of course. Which does beg the question what does that say about the political caliphs? But we'll leave that for another day. Hopefully. But you find that. These schools will return back to the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and return back to the students of the Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. The likes of Bishr al Hafi, Shafiq al Balkhi, Ma'roof al Karhi. These are renowned mystics in the Sufi path. Yes. And these are students of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, be it Imam al Kadhim, be it Imam al Radha, for example. Now, a person may say, I want to become a Shia Sufi. You've already got the wonderful supplications of, of the Ahlul Bayt السلام. You don't need to call yourself a Sufi. Ahlul Bayt school is already a spiritual, mystical, ethical school. Yes. 
schools that needed Sufism are the ones that were riddled with political leaderships that completely lacked spirituality at the helm. Mm -hmm. Or scholars who were puppets of certain empires and therefore the people felt spirituality was missing. Mm -hmm. But certainly when you look at the school of Ahlul Bayt, the traditions of Al Muhammad in themselves allow a person to reach the highest levels of spirituality. Yes. Now Muhammad Mahdi Saleh, he says, uh, I am curious about this quote by Imam Ali. Two things define you, your patience when you have nothing and your attitude when you have everything. Is this legit? And is it really what Imam Ali said? If you could help me, please. Well, as for the reference of the quote, I don't know the reference of the quote. Um, he may have to go and search and we can search for him the exact reference of the quote. There are a lot of quotes on the internet which are attributed yeah. to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. But we can certainly go and research the reference for him mm -hmm. and give him the volume and the page number if we find it. Inshallah. Uh, now, another narration uh, regarding this, uh, the topic, uh, Sadiq, uh, she says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidina. Imam uh, Sadiq alayhi salam says, Eid is not when you wear new clothes, but it is when you don't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this narration accurate to Imam Sadiq or different Imam? The Imam, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's one is a lot more accurate. Every day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not disobeyed is a day of Eid. Mm -hmm. And that would be a conclusive tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, now the other question we have is regarding wudu. Uh, this person is saying, uh, I have a broken hand and I don't know how to do wudu on the, uh, the rap. How do you do that? Well, we already have the traditions and the clear references in the books of our maraja as to the person who is wearing, mm -hmm. for example, that bandage or the person who's wearing a cast, exactly how they pour the water or how they wipe over that cast. All of these can be found in the respective book of your marja. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question we have is Sayyidina, uh, we always hear that shaking the hand with the opposite sex is not allowed in Islam. However, Sometimes we fall into a situation where our job depends on us. What do we do? Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life, mentions that the shake of the hands with the opposite gender, is some, uh, someone who's not mahram to you, something is not, is not allowed unless it's going to bring harm to the image of the religion of Islam or cause distress in that situation. Mm -hmm. Now certainly you may be in a situation where you don't have to put your hand out, but if you know you're going to bring harm to the image of the religion of Islam at that moment, then you have that guidance from your marja. Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Fayyad in a discussion also mentioned the same thing. That if the lady puts out her hand, this lady is not a Muslim. You don't, if you pull your hand back, that will cause harm to the image of the religion and unbearable distress for that person. Yes. Then a person is able to shake the hand. But mm -hmm. a person should not necessarily be the one who initiates. Bali. Uh, now, this person is saying, uh, we have a lot of narrations and in the Quran it mentions that it is mandatory to go to Hajj. However, due to the situation in, in Saudi Arabia, I choose not to go. Is this haram or halal? Well, if you refer back to your marja on this issue, if your marja, for example, has made a statement to say that Hajj is not obligatory on the Muslims in this year because there's been an act of oppression, that marja may see in his position as re representative of the Imam, that in the same way someone like Imam al-Jawad may have for example, forbidden a certain act on a certain year because of a certain issue, then Marja may see in his representation of the Imam that yes. he's allowed to do the same. Mm -hmm. However, if all of us are not going to turn up for Hajj, then who's going to be there to honor the heritage of the religion of Islam, the visitation to the tomb of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, the visitation to the cemetery of Jannat al baqiyah So at the end of the day, if you're using it as an excuse not to go to Hajj because of your laziness or you don't want to spend money, Allah already knows. Yes. If your marja has given you a guideline, then you follow the guideline of your marja. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Kanzei Fatima, she says, why does Surat Al-Kahf, or how is Surat Al-Kahf related to Imam al Hussein in eulogies as we hear? Because of the fact that the Christian priest who saw the prisoners of Karbala and the 10th of Muharram, when they had come with the soldiers of Yazid on their way to Sham, when they went on their way to Sham, they stopped at a monastery. At this monastery, the priest or the monk who was running the monastery was asked by the soldiers of Yazid, 
if they were able to keep the heads of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam mm -hmm. and his family members there and stay there for the night. Yes. Now, this priest, you find, said to them, there is no issue. And while looking at the heads on the spears, he asked about one particular head. Okay. He said, whose head is that one there? They said to him, what do you have to do with the head? He said, I want to ask about the head of that one there. The reply came, that's the head of Hussein bin Ali. Now, the beginning, there's a question as to whether he recognizes the name or whether they actually say the name in its exact form or they say leader of the rebels. But eventually, while washing the face of Imam al Hussein, he hears the quotation from the story of Ashab al Kahf, the verse. So the head was reciting? The head, the head recites, it's a karama, it's a miracle from God. Where the head, he hears a voice from the head saying, Do you think that the companions of the cave are a sign of God? I, Hussein bin Ali, am the greatest sign of God. So this priest is known to have reverted towards the religion of Islam, having witnessed this miracle. Mm -hmm. Now, the story of the companions of the cave may be mentioned in certain Christian pieces of literature as the story of the seven sleepers of Ephesius. The seven sleepers of Ephesus. Ephesus. These people were people who worshipped God, mm -hmm. followed the message of Christ, yes. but were harassed and were oppressed by their people because they had not followed any polytheistic ideology. So that priest would have already known about the story of the seven sleepers of Ephesus. They were a sign from God because of the fact that they slept for how long? Over 300, Over years. 300 years. Now that Christian priest would have been aware if that head, a voice comes from it, says, do you think that those Christians were a sign from God? Then know that I, Hussein, son of Ali, am the greatest of the signs of God. So therefore, the connection between the story of the companions of the cave and the story of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is in relation to the journey of the Ahlul Bayt from Karbala to Kufa towards Sham when they stopped at this monastery, that was the incident that took place. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, Ali said, he says, why is there more than one meaning to, uh, to a verse in the Quran? Well, where do you begin with that answer? Firstly, who do you take your understanding of that verse from? Yeah, say Imam Sadiq. I, as a follower of Ahlul Bayt, may take my understanding of an eye of the Holy Quran yes. and the sabab and nuzul of that ayah from the Ahl al-Bayt Others may take it from the school of the companions. Okay. So if there's an eye of the Holy Quran, for example, such as, let's say, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا Imam al-Baqir Imam al-Sadiq clearly show us that such an ayah was revealed in honor of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatwa al-Zahra When they would about, be about to break their fast, they'd always give towards the poor. Mm -hmm. And when the captive knocked at the door, the captive. And when the orphan knocked at the door, the orphan. يُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا You'll find that others do narrate this. Then there are others who completely want to hide and say this has nothing to do with Ahlul Bayt mm -hmm. Therefore, when someone tells me there's a different possible meaning, where are you gaining the knowledge of the Quran from? Are you gaining the knowledge of the Quran from the Ahlul Bayt who were alongside the Quran? The Prophet said, I leave behind for you two weighty things, the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Or are you gaining that knowledge of the Quran from people outside of the school of Ahlul Bayt? Or from people outside of the Ahlul Bayt Yes. Secondly, no doubt that there may be a number of layers of interpretation of one eye of the Holy Quran. Some traditions even mention there's seven layers of one eye of the Holy Quran. There's a zahiri meaning and a batani meaning. Why? You'll find that our understanding and the development of our spirituality differs from person to person. Oh, For someone... some, 
a surface level answer mm -hmm. is enough guidance. But if someone knows the full, it's different when someone knows a part of the truth or the full truth. Subhanallah, sometimes people have been revealed and given the full truth, but arrogantly rejected it. Quran even says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيَّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَىٰ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنَهُمُ اللَّاعِنُونَ Wow. Some people actually concealed, even though they were given the answer, hidden meaning, external meaning, ظاهر باطن. Some were given the meaning, but they concealed it from the people out of jealousy. Some of us, are the khawas of the Shia. Some are the khawas of the khawas. There's a difference in the levels. What do you mean by that? Rasulullah himself would say, Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi, Salman is on 10th level of faith, Abu Dhar 9, Maghdad 8, Ammar 7. All of them have a certain capacity. 10 being the highest? 10 being the highest. Salman's capacity to understand Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is higher than Abu Dhar. But they're all great mu'mineen. There is sometimes when it comes to an ayah of the Quran, Ahlul Bayt reveals some secrets about the ayah in its fullest meaning to Salman, which maybe this Abu Dhar could not comprehend. So therefore you find either Sabab in Nuzul, depends where you're getting it from, or sometimes you have to ask, is this the hidden meaning? Is mm -hmm. this the external meaning? Mm -hmm. Is this the internal meaning? And then you'll be able to understand why there are different layers to a particular eye of the Quran. Oh, now, since we mentioned the companions of Badr and Salman, there's one narration that goes to my mind when I hear these two names together. If Abadar knows what's in the heart or the knowledge of Salman, he would have killed about him. Ali. About Ali? Yes, why about Imam Ali alayhi salam. Why would he kill him? Well, the thing is, obviously, th these types of traditions are very mystical. Okay. And it's clear that the comprehension that Salman has in his relationship with Imam Ali Oh, didn't Abadar have the same relationship? Abadar's level of taqwa, some compare it to Nabi Isa Oh, that's huge. However, Salman, the Prophet said, is from us, the Ahlul Bayt. There are certain secrets revealed to Salman. There is certain guidance offered to Salman, which Abu Dhar, how great he is, wouldn't handle would not be able to necessarily handle. Mm -hmm. Remember, these aren't infallible. They're on different levels. But clearly, Ahlul Bayt have told us who's on the highest of levels. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the other question we have uh, is, why would Allah tell Prophet Abraham to sacrifice his son? These are all moments where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see the development of his creation. Some of us call it a test. I say on the contrary. But, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see the development of one's creation, okay. of one's abilities. You claim to love me. What are you willing to do? Me and you, we claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I guarantee you there's certain things we won't do. You ask many Muslims, you love Allah? I said, I love Allah. I tell him Fajr, he makes a billion excuses why he's not going to wake up. Not even not going to wake up, he's put it part, part of his life that he won't wake up. If I'm near a mosque at Fajr, I'll wake up. But if I'm, if I'm asleep at 11, I will not wake up. I don't care what any of you say to me. Sometimes when Allah sends us a test, me and you look at it as a test. I look at it as a development for me. It takes me back to Fajr again because I appreciate what I have. Nabi Ibrahim salam, what happens with his son? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, what I will sacrifice? Have you not trusted me in the past? When you were in the fire, I didn't make it cool. But telling someone to butcher your son. It's like Allah telling, you know, uh, it won't Is happen. Is he ready? Was he ready to do it? He was. He was ready. But it's what kind of test is Ultimate it? show of love. And sometimes people will say, why is he a prophet and not me? What some will say at that time, why is he a prophet and not me? What, because he obeys a lot to butcher his son? No. It's because me, I'll set conditions for when I want to do things with Allah and I'll pick and choose what I want to do. Okay. Salah suits me, I'll do it. But Hajj, I'll make excuses. I'll go when I want to go, not when you want me to come. 
Ibrahim highlighted at one moment the difference between prophethood and any other creation is the willingness to wholeheartedly submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without questioning one moment of submission. Shaytan's telling him, leave it. That's why we throw the stones. Leave it. What are you doing? I will go the whole way. Yeah. And he's even disappointed when it turns out to be a goat, goat sheep, ram, whatever it turns out. He's disappointed. Yeah. But Allah tells him, do not worry. We accept it. Yes. That one moment Allah highlighted the prophets of mine, whatever I ask from them, they're ready to sacrifice. I'm saying that. Uh, the last question for tonight, uh, is it allowed to listen to rap music without music played in it? But then that doesn't come under the category customarily known as rap. Because in our society today, rap is customarily known. If you're living, for example, in the West, you expect there to be a beat and track and tune and instruments and everything going with it. If, for example, a person is saying that all I'm doing is reciting spoken word poetry, but in a very fast beat, there's no issue there, as long as, of course, the wording is not that which is contradictory to the Quran and the Ahl al Bayt's teachings. But the moment you start bringing the world of tunes and instruments alongside all of this, then that's where a person has to ask themselves, is the tune from the people of disobedience of Allah? Is it from the people of Fisk and Fujur, for example? Is the words opposite to the teaching of Ahl al-Bayt? Will this be played at a club? And so on, other issues begin to come into yes. the issue. Sayyidina, thank you very much for joining us over these Thank you. Uh, I love these tonight. nights and uh, please don't forget me in your prayers in and Karbala. Sayyidina, we need your prayers. Thank you so Allah much. I know you too. Uh, you're God killer, we say it. Habibi. Allah is uh, Now, Now, respect viewers, thank you very much for tuning in. It is the final night. Uh, we'll say it Ammar for tonight, yeah, for, for, for this period. Hopefully, it won't be the final night uh, for the upcoming uh, future, inshallah. Thank you very much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.